Hello and welcome to this debate for the 94th District in the Wisconsin State Assembly. My name is Anthony Tregoski and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank the many sponsors and supporters of this debate. These sponsors include WKBT News 8 Now, WXOW News 19, the La Crosse Tribune, Wisconsin Public Radio, WIZM Radio, Midwest Family La Crosse, Leadership Ethics La Crosse, the La Crosse Area Chamber of Commerce, the League of Women Voters of the La Crosse Area, and the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Thank you to all of those sponsors for their fantastic support of this debate. The candidates for the 94th Assembly District are Representative Steve Doyle, Kevin Hoyer, and Leroy Brown. Representative Doyle is the candidate of the Democratic Party. Mr. Hoyer is the candidate of the Republican Party, and Mr. Brown is running as an independent candidate. The format for this debate will be as follows. Each candidate will receive one minute for an opening statement. Then members of our media panel will take turns asking questions of the candidates. When asked a question, a candidate will have one minute and 15 seconds to respond to that question. After that, the other candidates will have 45 seconds for rebuttal and follow up. We will conclude this debate with closing statements by the candidates. Our media panel today features Mike Biermeister from WXOW News 19, Isabella Hulsizer from WKBT News 8 Now, Bob Heiss from the La Crosse Tribune, and Ezra Wall from Wisconsin Public Radio. The League of Women Voters of the La Crosse area is generously providing assistance with keeping track of speaking time. Thank you, Nora Garland, for providing this assistance today. I ask the candidates to refrain from interrupting one another and I ask the candidates to respect time limits for their responses. I will reinforce time cues as needed throughout the debate. Through a random draw, we have concluded, we have determined that Mr. Brown will go first, Mr. Hoyer will go second, and Representative Doyle will go third. Mr. Brown, over to you. You have one minute for your opening statement. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. I'm a longtime district resident, having called this county my home for over two decades. I've been on the West Salem Village Board since 2015, and I've been able to work with counterparts in Onalaska and Holman overseeing the Shared Ride program. At the county level, I'm on LAPC's Committee for Transit and Active Transportation. I'm active in the community, having been on the June Dairy Days Board, and currently serving on the West Salem Area Community Foundation, where I've been president since 2018. One of the things I really admire about our area is the sense of community you can find anywhere from the ridge to the Mindoro Cut, from Bangor to Bryce's Prairie. People are willing to help one another and come together for a common cause. It's one of our region's greatest strengths. I would love to bring this spirit to Madison and would be honored if you'd give me that chance by voting for me this November. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer, you have one minute for your opening statement. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Tregoski. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Doyle and Mr. Brown for also uh, running and, uh, and occupying the seat that we currently have. Um, I am a lifelong resident of West Salem, um, born and raised on a dairy farm just north of town. My, my wife and I still, still operate that farm to this day. I, I currently sit on the county board, been there for three years where, I, uh, where I've had the opportunities to help, um, help uh, legislate or help add some uh, some teeth into uh, environmental issues uh, along the lines of sustainability. My other um, obligations I've had is the town board for four years. I've also sat for nine years on a national uh, grassroots egg policy organization where we work nonpartisanly across, um, across different lines to make sure that uh, we worked on issues such as environmental issues, sustainability issues, uh, roads, funding, environmental, um, or excuse me, um, economic issues and rural development. It, this has also taken me to, to areas that I've been able to, to help with in trade from locally to around the world. I look forward to uh, answering all the questions and um, serving the constituents of the 94th district. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle, you have one minute for your opening statement. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks for everybody for participating. 
Uh, a few months ago, the Legislative Reference Bureau I did a study and determined that I'm the most bipartisan member of the state assembly. And that's something that I really am proud of because everything that I have done since I was elected in 2011 uh, has based on, upon the idea of getting people to work together. Uh, and that's why in this election, I have the endorsement of numerous organizations, labor unions, business groups, environmental groups, uh, individual people that I have worked with uh, who found me to be not somebody who simply follows a party line, uh, but look at the interest of, of my particular district. Uh, in particular, I've worked closely with uh, some of our major local employers like Quick Trip and, and Mathy, um, because that is something that really makes a difference for our particular community. So going forward, that is my plan to continue. I want to have my door open to anybody who's interested in uh, issues facing the state legislature, knowing that you can come to me and always expect a fair answer. Thank you, Representative Doyle. We now turn to our media panel. We have a question for Mr. Brown from Mike Biermeister of WXOW News 19. Mike, over to you. In one of their most recent reviews that Wisconsin has had the least active full-time legislature in the nation since the start of the pandemic finding that other states met 18 times more frequently than their Wisconsin counterpoints. As Wisconsin faces more cases and deaths from COVID-19, how will you rise above partisan politics to help Wisconsinites get the care and support they need facing the virus? Mr. Brown, you have one minute and 15 seconds. All righty, thank you. And yes, it, it's been pretty frustrating seeing our legislature, you know, sitting on the sidelines as all of this has gone on. I definitely wish they would be uh, more active in trying to respond to help people uh, as they deal with the, you know, the the health and economic consequences of the outbreak. Um, if I were on the legislature, I would be pushing hard to to get us into session, um, to to go over bills, you know, at least have that debate, show people that we we are concerned for their well-being, again, both in terms of health and in finances, instead of just shouting out when something happens that we don't like, actually come up with things that uh, might help people out. Um, Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Hoyer, you have 45 seconds for follow-up. It is concerning how party politics has driven a wedge, um, not only here uh, locally, but around the country. And that is, is attributed to um, the far right and far left. Um, we need to put that aside. We need to work together and we have to be sure that we are not um, not following the lead of, of some of our, our party leaders, but to make sure that we are looking out for the, the best interests of the 94th district. If elected, that's what I'm going to do. Nonpartisan is all I've ever been working across party lines to make sure that those that I represent have their voices heard in Madison and not the other way around. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle, you have 45 seconds. Thank you. It's really unfortunate that the legislature has not been in session for the last six months when we have uh, a pandemic that we're dealing with from a health standpoint, and we also have an economic crisis with people being out of work. Uh, there have been many opportunities for us to go back into session in terms of a special session, uh, but that hasn't happened. Um, I'm ready to go back tomorrow. I, I'm getting paid for a job that I want to do, um, and I'm, I have repeatedly called upon our legislative leadership to get us back into session so that we can be at the table with the governor and start to work on problems that are facing our state and coming up with some bipartisan solutions, which is what really everyone is asking for and the time is now. So I'm ready to go back to work right today. Thank you, Representative Doyle. We next have a question for Mr. Hoyer from Isabella Hulsizer of WKBT News 8 Now. Isabella, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. School districts in the 94th have switched to virtual learning or are prepped for virtual learning if needed, but access to the internet can prove to be a challenge for some families living in more rural areas. Um, some have expressed that the hot spots given to them from school just don't work. What would you do um, in office to assist these families and to provide the infrastructure that's needed? Mr. Hoyer. Well, it certainly is a challenge when we get into the rural areas of the state, not only um, in, in La Crosse County as well, and uh, broadband internet is, uh, is, a, is a basic need that I think we all have to be look at. Our children depend on that, our businesses depend on that, and the longer we stay virtual in schools and through this pandemic, our, our kids are falling behind. They need the, the physical and social interaction um, and teachers are unable to, to catch them as they fall through the cracks. 
So it, we need to work on uh, sufficient resources such as broadband to adequately allow um, virtual connections. Um, I, I, looked, I looked to see wh what we're doing now. How can it be safe to have our YM and YWCAs open and yet not let our schools be open for in-person in learning? And that's something that really concerns me as, uh, as our family units struggle to survive through this, our small businesses survive to be able to struggle to survive be able to keep their employees employed and keep our economy moving. So that's something that I would take uh, very seriously and uh, working through the National Federation of Independent Businesses, I certainly would, uh, would step up and make sure that our small businesses, our community, our schools and our families have the proper needs to be able to, to, to cope with the current pandemic and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle. Thank you. Generations ago, roads were considered uh, our major form of infrastructure. After that, we had the electrical grid and now our infrastructure really, you have to look at it as broadband and the internet. If you don't have access to that, you're not able to compete, whether it's in terms of business or, or getting an education that will give you a, a well-paying job. That's why I co-sponsored uh, six bills in this last session that related to expanding broadband access in rural Wisconsin. Uh, because that is something that I've heard from my constituents. It's a message that I took to Madison. Uh, unfortunately, the legislature then decided to go home early uh, and not pass the bills that were sitting there waiting to, to uh, be considered and voted upon that would, would uh, expand that broadband access throughout our state. I'm hoping to have a chance to do that again because it's a problem that's not going to go away. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, so for me, you know, I understand, and this is 2020, we are two decades into the 21st century. We need internet access to be able to, to compete and to live daily life, really. Um, I, what I would do is look at what models are being used in other, other places to try and um, expand that access, work either with public or private means to, to get more internet into rural areas. Uh, for instance, I spoke with a, a gentleman who spoke very highly of their internet down in Vernon County and using, uh, I believe it was a cooperative method. And, you know, looking at duplicating that across the state, I think would be very beneficial. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next, we have a question for Representative Doyle from Bob Heiss of the La Crosse Tribune. Bob, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I recently came from Kenosha, where over there, there's an active recall uh, people signing uh, about Governor Evers. And, and the concern is the de uh, what the, was considered by some as a delay to the civil unrest and the rioting that happened in Kenosha. It took a day and a half really for the full enforcement to be able to, to and, and of course, one night of burning in the, in the city. Uh, I wonder what your what you think of the state's response should have been have been better, and what are what about other times these this happens in Wisconsin cities? Is the state going to be ready to do a better response than Kenosha? Representative Doyle, thank you. Well, first of all, let me just say that violence is never an appropriate form of expression. Uh, whether you are objecting to uh, somebody getting elected, you're getting you're objecting to uh, racial treatment, or whatever the case may be. Uh, we learned from people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King that violence is not the solution, but rather peaceful protest. However, there are people that don't subscribe to that attitude, and we have to be ready for that. Uh, I think that Governor Evers uh, did the best that he could by calling in the National Guard the next day. Um, unfortunately, there was damage that happened in the meantime, which actually, I think, hurts the cause of the people that uh, were trying to make their point. I think that we have to be on the alert for violence going forward. Uh, we've seen in Michigan and, and with the uh, concern that that was even spreading to uh, Virginia uh, about militias that are out there that may want to uh, engage in violent and, and uh, perhaps even fatal type of, of activities. Uh, so I would hope that the governor is ready at any point to, to take action if necessary. We know that we have an election coming up that is very contentious. And it's likely that we'll see people acting up as a result of whoever wins or doesn't win that election. I hope we're ready at that point. But it's really in the hands of the governor. And, and uh, I think that he knows now that uh, he's got to be ready at, at a moment's notice. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, one of the things with the with the urban unrest that we're seeing around the country, I, I think of um, 
I believe it was Martin Luther King, and I may be paraphrasing, but that riot is the is the language of the unheard. Um, and while violence is never the answer to getting these things solved, we should be listening to try and find ways to reduce the stress and the strain in society from whatever cause it may be coming from, to try and alleviate these pressures so people can live more productive, uh, more carefree lives, um, get to pursue and appreciate and achieve that American dream. Um, and I would work towards policies that help to identify and alleviate um, stress and strain in, in our society. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer. Uh, thank you very much. I want to go back to the last question, just to make a point um, Mr. Doyle had stated. In the last budget, he voted against a $44 million broadband expansion grant. Um, that, that certainly does not help to get our broadband um, going here within the state. Now, um, to this question, uh, what happened in Kenosha? It's unfortunate that uh, we have issues like this. But, but what is really the, the crux of the problem is, is our leadership. Uh, Mr. Doyle is right. It is in the hands of our governor. And when our governor comes out within 12 hours of this incident and lays blame at the feet of the police, then to turn around and, and state publicly that he doesn't have all the, all the information, how, how can we respond to that? How, I mean, it's, it's unconscionable, not to mention that when he was asked um, to, to, bring out the National Guard to help um, stop some of these violent acts. He didn't give them the, the proper you. resources. So we need we need to work better on leadership. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. We have a question for Mr. Brown from Ezra Wall of Wisconsin Public Radio. Ezra, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate it. Mr. Brown, unemployment spiked at around 14% 14. 14. Uh, during the shutdown related to COVID-19. And for some, that unemployment spike revealed the tenuous nature of a completely employer-based insurance system. What can be done to ensure that every Wisconsinite has access to affordable health insurance coverage? Thank you, Ezra. Um, I definitely would like to see us move away from the employer-based, you know, the, the exclusively employer-based model, um, possibly looking at industry-wide health care plans or even um, you know, even even looking elsewhere to just to make sure people can't be without affordable and quality health care and that and that, like you said, this this ep uh, epidemic has laid bare the weaknesses in our current system. Um, you know, if we're if we're relying on our employment to give us uh, that health insurance and then our employment goes away, we are, you know, we're, we're up a creek. So I definitely would like to see uh, us look into other alternatives, try and separate out give people a little more freedom. And even on the employment front, um, people people don't need to be chained into a job they don't like just for the insurance. I would like to see people feel more comfortable and have the market be more fluid so that they could move from job to job, confident that their, you know, their quality health care will remain with them. So that I would uh, look and pursue those sorts of policies if, if I were elected to the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer. Health insurance is important. Health care is important. We all need to have that. It's, it's vital to our, to our sustainability of our culture. We need to have choices. Wisconsin has one of the best programs out there. If we relied solely on one system, let's take Medicaid. Medicaid does not pay 100% or even close to what the costs are. Wisconsin's Badger Care, Wisconsin's uh, system that they do have covers, covers that gap. There is no gap. We need to have the ability to make the choices between the insurance that are provide, that are privatized or, or public insurance or what Wisconsin offers. So to me, having the choices, having the ability to, uh, to make the choices that are correct for our family, correct for our business is important and not to rely on one single payer or one type of insurance that we need to go forward with. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle. Thank you. Uh, one obvious thing that we should be doing at this point is following the lead of most of the other states in the country and accept the Medicaid expansion money. Uh, that Those are dollars that Wisconsin taxpayers send off to Washington that right now are getting sent to other states that have expanded their Medicaid program. In terms of Wisconsin, that would mean an additional approximately $300 million per year that could go a long way to doing two things, raise, or lowering the cost of 
uh, of coverage and raising the number of people who are eligible and are being covered by health insurance. Uh, for me, it's just unconscionable that we're not doing that, given that the governors and, and legislatures of both parties in other states are saying, that's our money, we would love to have it back. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Next, we have a question for Mr. Hoyer from Mike Beermeister of WXOW News 19. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Anthony. The American Society of Professional Engineers Wisconsin section gave Wisconsin's overall infrastructure a C with roads receiving a D minus grade. In 2018, roads were a major topic of discussion for this seat. So now that we're here in 2020, are roads in the district better than they were two years ago? Mr. Hoyer. I drive a grain truck up and down the road every day. No, our roads are terrible. What's really concerning to me is a few years ago, I sat and listened to our representative complain about how our roads are terrible and how the state of Wisconsin was not providing enough funding for local roads. Just recently in the last budget, there was an extra $900 million placed into, uh, into the transportation budget that was supposed to go directly to local road improvements. Our governor line item vetoed that, took that $90 million, cut it down to $75 million, and then put it into a grant that was open up to everybody to, to draw from. And that grant, the majority of it all went to Milwaukee or Madison for mass transit. And yet we didn't hear anything out of our representatives on how terrible that was that money was being pulled out of local road funding to go to Milwaukee or Madison for mass transit. Where's, where's the, I don't get it. I mean, years ago, it was all the legislature's fault for not giving us money. And now when the legislature gives us money, our governor takes it away and our representative backs the governor on this. We need to have someone that looks out for the 94th district and make sure that the money comes back to the 94th district to go to what it's needed for. Transportation Thank and you. road funding is, is one of the top priorities. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle. Thank you. As former county board chair here in La Crosse, I know very uh, deeply what the problems are with our local road funding um, and uh, have been a strong advocate uh, working with local companies, again, like Mathy, uh, to advocate for more spending on, on local roads and on, on state roads in Wisconsin here. Um, I don't agree with the governor's decision to send the money to mass transit. Um, and I have been working with the Wisconsin Counties Association and others, uh, also the Towns Association, as an attorney for one of our towns here in, in La Crosse County, to try to rectify that problem. About 20% of our local roads uh, across the state uh, are deemed deficient and need to be repaired, uh, or they're deemed poor and, and need to be repaired immediately. Uh, so that is a top priority that I've had. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. And yes, I, I definitely agree that our roads could be in better shape. While um, I definitely commend the crews who are out there putting them, you know, putting them in order as best they can. You know, we, we have a long, long way to go. A lot of miles still need to be fixed. Um, I definitely uh, would look at seeing how we can shore that up. Um, speaking to the line item veto, I'm not I'm not always a fan of the way that's used at the governor's level. I feel that uh, that it should be really about canceling out a provision, not changing the meaning of a provision. It doesn't matter which party's in power. You shouldn't be changing. You shouldn't be using your veto pen to write and rewrite law other than um, things that are truly objectionable. Then, um, but yeah, looking at finding uh, alternative funding methods for highways would be a big priority of mine. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next, we have a question for Representative Doyle from Isabella Halsizer of WKBT News 8 Now. Isabella, over to you. Thank you. Do you support the governor's latest emergency order to limit capacity in businesses to 25%? And what recommendations would you give to struggling businesses right now? So I support the efforts that the governor has been making to try to deal with the pandemic. The problem that I have is that Wisconsin does not have a plan. When I say that, what I mean is we don't have a plan because the governor unilaterally cannot create a plan. You're at least one that's gonna be followed by the citizens of our state um, and, and enforced. What we really need is the legislature to go back into session and we need to sit down with the governor and work out a plan that both sides can agree with so that then we can turn around to say to the people of Wisconsin, Democrats, Republicans, the legislature, the executive all agree, this is what we should be doing going forward. The fact that we don't even bother to go into session 
to talk about the issue, I think is shameful. Uh, and that's the, the top priority that I have in the immediate future is that we need to go back to session. We need to sit down at the table. We need to work out a plan. And then we need to tell the people that this is a plan that is in the best interest of our state and that we all are, are behind it. That's what's been lacking so far. I give the governor credit for trying, uh, but I think it's unfortunate that the legislature is basically played ostrich and sticking our head in the sand. That just can't go on. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with the spirit of the law. I'm, I'm question, I, I do question whether on its legality, uh, the continued extensions, and definitely agree that the legislature should step in to uh, provide the ultimate answer here. Um, what we've seen from the legislators so far has been an abdication of their responsibility to the people of Wisconsin, and um, it is shameful. We we should see them. They should be in session. They should be coming up with solutions, working with the governor so that we aren't put in these precarious positions. At the same time, we need to be looking out for our business owners and our, and our unemployed who are facing such hardships economically that they have to resort to court actions to try and uh, stop this. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer. Definitely need to take uh, this virus seriously. Um, it is something that we haven't dealt with um, or a pandemic of this nature for, for 100 years. Um, what do I tell the small businesses? That's, that's, that's a tough one because um, they need to survive. They need to be able to make the decisions that, uh, that is good for them, their families, and their business. Uh, these business owners um, need to have support to be able to uh, stay open during and even after the pandemic. So our, our employees have a place to go back to. Um, none of our business owners want to put their, their families and their jobs, their lives uh, in jeopardy. Um, so all businesses are essential. And I, I tell the small businesses that they need to get a hold of their representatives and tell them what they really think about this. And remember that a, a restaurant or tavern in West Salem does Thank not you. have the same um, same environment as one in West Dallas would have. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Next, I have a question submitted by the League of Women Voters of the La Crosse area, and I'd like to give each of you one minute and 15 seconds to respond to this question, starting with Mr. Brown. The question from the League of Women Voters reads as follows. The majority of voters in Wisconsin favor a fair method of redistricting, about 70%. 54 counties have passed a resolution and 17 have passed a referendum supporting fair maps. 11 counties have a referendum on the November ballot. With this overwhelming support, have you signed or will you sign the following fair maps pledge? It reads, quote, as a candidate for the Wisconsin State Assembly, I support an independent process to draw legislative district maps. I pledge to support fair maps legislation to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin and will refuse to vote for any gerrymandering scheme. If elected, I will fight to ensure the next redistricting process results in fair maps for the next decade. Uh, Mr. Hoyer, uh, sorry, Mr. Brown first, then Mr. Hoyer. Uh, Mr. Brown, do you or would you support that pledge? Yes, wholeheartedly yes. Um, the the issue of gerrymandering is an issue that is very, very dear to my campaign. Um, it is it is part of the impetus for it. Truly, the uh, the hoarding of, of districts and the and, and votes by a party to disenfranchise the other is wholly unfair and undemocratic, um, and has no place in the operations of our republic. I would work towards creating that independent body or otherwise making institutional change that allowed for our districts to be representative of the people who live there. And also, I mean, another another thing to consider is that our districts, even when they're competitive, we're still, you know, potentially disenfranchising 50% of the vote. So another thing I would be interested in looking at would be finding an institutional means of ensuring their voices are continue to be heard even after election day. Um, if, you know, if they made it onto the ballot and they get a certain amount of votes while they don't get a seat and they don't get to speak on the floor, they may still be deserving of some, some manner of role in the shaping of, of life in our state. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer. Thank you. I had to take a drink of water from my well here on the farm to make sure I could, I could um, get this out. Um, redistricting, uh, we, well, we all deserve to have a realistic uh, district to represent us. 
Um, as far as uh, signing any sort of uh, agreement, um, every every policy or every everything that comes up wants you to sign something. No, no new taxes. Um, we need redistricting. Sign this. Sign that. Um, it's all purely political. Um, we have to face uh, some reality here. Uh, first off, the way our districts are designed or how they are chosen in Wisconsin is is in the Constitution. To change that needs an amendment. And so a constitutional amendment needs to happen. I'm certainly open to discussion on, on looking at making sure our districts are fair, they're balanced, and they represent the people the way they should be. Um, you know, something to look at though, we talk about a non-partisan non or bipartisan uh, committee is our current bipartisan, nonpartisan elections commission how effective is that in getting its work done? Um, they can't even come up with a uh, with an idea there because uh, it's it's always split. And uh, even if the governor puts something out there, it, it's always going to be partisan. And and furthermore, the push behind this seems to be coming from the National yeah. Democratic Redistricting Pack, which, by the way, thousand dollars was given to my opponent, Steve Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer, Representative Doyle. And yes, I'm very proud that uh, I merited their uh, support because that is something that uh, in a heartbeat, I would sign that pledge. Uh, and not only would I sign that pledge, but I in fact have co-sponsored uh, the redistricting bills every time that they have come up in the legislature. Uh, I've never been given the opportunity to vote on them because they're, they have not been brought up uh, for a vote. But here's the problem with gerrymandered districts is when you have districts where it's the, the voters are packed in there in a lopsided fashion. What it does is it creates a, a lack of communication between the parties. So if I am a, a Democrat from Milwaukee, I know that I have to be as democratic as possible because I'm gonna be challenged in a primary if I'm not as extreme as I can get. If I am a Republican in suburban uh, Milwaukee area, I need to be as conservative and as extreme as possible, or I may find a, a, a primary challenge. What that means is, is the Democrats and Republicans not only don't communicate with each other, they don't even speak the same language because there is a disincentive for cooperating with the other party. I, in fact, am the only Democrat in the entire state assembly that represents a Republican-leaning district. And I have won in the last several elections uh, by pretty comfortable margins because the people of my district recognize that I do speak the language of both the Democrats and the Republicans. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Next, we have a question for Mr. Brown from Bob Heiss of the La Crosse Tribune. Bob, over to you. I'd like to get back to education a minute and talk about uh, the large dist largest districts in La Crosse are, are all virtual. And how long can this go? I mean, what, what, what are your feeling about the schools at least offering hybrid and in, and in person, knowing that a lot of students may fall behind? And, and the other part of the question is, if schools continue to be virtual for perhaps the whole year, are you going to start questioning funding? Mr. Brown. All righty, and thank you. And for me personally, I, I wouldn't bring the question of funding into this. I believe that our districts are probably scraping by as it is with, um, you know, reduced revenues and reduced activities going on that um, they need to, you know, they need all the help they can get. Um, I would also be interested in looking at ways of expanding district funding so they're not so dependent on the property tax. But get, to get to your point of the, uh, the virtual learning environment, um, I definitely want to see our students succeed, and I, I just don't want to see them become carriers for something and infect others unintentionally. Um, you know, if that means smaller class sizes, working, um, trying to establish classrooms outside of the school where smaller groups can be held, um, you know, what have you. We may need to think outside the box on this one, but just to keep people, keep people safe, keep people distance, and make sure they're getting the best education they can, uh, given the circumstances of this environment. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer. It is a concern to a lot of parents. Um, the doors I've been knocking on the last month, month and a half, um, when I'm asking the question about education, they, uh, the vast majority would like to see their kids go back to, to learning um, in school versus virtually. Again, it falls back to children learn better by doing. They, they become better citizens by being socially uh, active with others. 
Um, the other thing we really need to be looking at here is school choice, making sure that our parents have the ability to make the choices that they need to make for their children to put them in a school that makes the best sense for them and to be able to help the funding source of that to be able to, to, to help them achieve that. That just raises competition for the education system and we'll have better citizens uh, down the road because of that. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle. I think the decision of whether to have virtual schools or face-to-face -face school um, really needs to be a local one because uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, things are different around the state and uh, the right decision for La Crosse, for example, may be the, uh, a different decision than for Onalaska or Melrose Mindoro and so forth. So I support the local decision in that regard. The state's role, I think though, is to make it as safe as possible so that when the schools are ready to have the in-person uh, teaching that their students actually uh, will have the protective uh, the PPE uh, equipment will have uh, you know confidence their parents will have confidence that, that is a safe environment and that we won't have a flare-up again of uh, of the pandemic. Thank you Representative Doyle. Next we go to Ezra Wall of WPR. Ezra has a question for Mr. Hoyer. Ezra over to you. Mr. Hoyer, ending partisan gridlock is a popular election year promise, regardless of party. And since my Midwestern parents always taught me it takes two to argue, I'm going to ask you, what does your party need to do to better bring a bipartisan spirit of cooperation to the state assembly? I look at it more of what do I bring to this? I've been nonpartisan um, representing people pretty much my whole entire adult life starting back in 2003 when I served on um, both state and national policy boards. Um, bring that right back to our county board and township board. It takes the right person in the seat to be able to carry on that conversation with the rest of the, the members within the assembly to, to get something done positively. Uh, grassroots, my campaign is grassroots and it's nonpartisan. That's how we're going to get something done. Set aside party politics and make sure that uh, we look at the, uh, the positives and everything we have um, and move forward. Um, it's not about asking our, our, our leaders, how should we vote? A true leader does not go to his governor or his party leader and says, this is a tough vote. AB Bill 76 um, was a prime example of Representative Doyle switching his vote bipartisanly. Um, he voted for it once to turn around and uh, when it came back in front of the legislature to override the governor's veto, he admitted he didn't know how to vote. So he went to the governor to ask how he should vote and his party um, leader how he should vote. That's not bucking your party. That's voting by party politics. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle. Thank you. Uh, I think bipartisanship really involves working together with everyone and making sure that people understand where you're coming from and you listening to where they're coming from. Uh, I would note that uh, in his three years on the county board, Mr. Hoyer has only made one motion on the floor of the, the county board, uh, and that motion uh, failed. And not only did it fail, he was the only one who voted for it. So every one of his colleagues said, we don't agree with, with what you're doing here. You didn't do your homework. You didn't try to, to convince people that you were doing the right thing. With regard to AB 76, I voted uh, against my party uh, the first go around. And then when I found that the governor had a proposal to accomplish the same thing without the need for a veto override, which by the way, did get accomplished. It was the CNA bill. Um, it, it made sense to say, let's not override the governor's veto. Let's accomplish it Thank a different, you. less confrontational way. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. And it's, it's, it's interesting to hear when my, when my um, uh, opponents in this race or, or competitors in this race will, will, will describe their, their nonpartisan um, back, you know, background in, in such a partisan framework. Um, I, I ran independent because I couldn't in good conscience uh, tie myself to either one of the, the two right now. Um, I would like to see, though, I would like to work with members of both parties to um, to achieve what we can in, in uh, you know, that that if it weren't for the letter next to the name of the sponsor would be, you know, common sense, no non issues of getting them passed. Um, and and that that would be what my focus would be in uh, Madison. 
Thank you, Mr. Brown. We have a question for Representative Doyle from Mike Biermeister of WXOW News 19. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Anthony. We continue to see issues with the unemployment system as we just this week, we have viewers calling our station um, saying that they still have not been approved for unemployment or they're having other problems just getting through. How will you use your legislative power to demand action from the Department of Workforce Development? Actually, I already have been working on that issue. And uh, uh, those of you who listen to the radio know that earlier this summer, I was running ads on multiple radio stations, uh, encouraging people to contact my office if they were having a difficult time getting their unemployment compensation or their small business loan and so forth. We have, my office has helped over 200 people uh, to get those things uh, and to, you know, to, to get their life back on track in that regard. Uh, I supported the governor's uh, 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 move to replace the, the head of that agency uh, because it just wasn't working out the way that it should have. I also volunteered my Madison staff uh, to go over to that agency uh, and put in time uh, to process the, the various applications. In the end, it turned out that the agency chose not to accept that offer, uh, but I was one of the first in line saying, I've got people in, in my office, they know what they're doing and they're happy to help out. So those are the, the things uh, that really I think the the one on one kind of support that you can get from a legislator uh, in helping you with your with your concerns is something that I, I think my office has really excelled at and people feel very comfortable calling my office to ask for that help. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. And, and for my part, I would be I would be uh, going to bat for each and every person who came in and said, you know, we've been having this difficulty trying to get this, um, especially now with with everything going on. You know, people need to have a source of income if their job shut down because of the outbreak. We can't in good conscience um, keep them from that. Uh, I, I do suspect part of the issue is uh, systemic in the sense that there could be like old software and things that just makes it untenable to process that large amount of requests. I know we were seeing similar things out of other states where they just they didn't have the infrastructure or the computer systems to get everything that they needed taken care of. And um, looking at making those investments to strengthen the system going forward would be a high priority of mine as well. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. No one should have to wait this long for their unemployment or their benefits. And uh, I have heard that it is a, uh, uh, an issue with uh, software and hardware. That should not have happened. That's a, that's a definite lack of leadership failure to plan, even though it's hard to plan for a pandemic. Um, we, need, we need to take a hard look at moving resources to the right direction to make sure that those who are suffering through this pandemic get paid and paid quickly. And uh, as far as the, uh, the county board thing, I asked for a transparency uh, amendment to a resolution that um, gave up power of the county board to our administrator. And Mr. Doyle was the first to stand up and say, oh, we don't need that because I trust our leadership. They'll do the right thing for us only to find out later that they failed to communicate with our health care professionals during this COVID crisis and had Thank to scrap the COVID-19 and start all over again. That's you, why Mr. I had, had added that amendment. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Next, we have a question for Mr. Brown from Isabella Halsizer of WKBT News 8 Now. Isabella? Thank you. What is the biggest agriculture issue you find farmers in the district um, are dealing with and how would you prioritize that if elected to office? Thank you. And right now, I would definitely say it's the, the market that they're all facing, um, especially I know a lot of our dairy farmers. I'm sure Kevin will have something to say on this in a moment, but a lot of our dairy farmers have been on hard times and, um, you know, struggling to to make ends meet in the current environment, um, working with them and our other agricultural sectors to make sure they have the support. Um, I spoke with an agricultural group recently that um, expressed the phosphorus limits and the runoff issues are, are you know, breaking the bank for some of them and looking at ways while we definitely need to rein in phosphorus. I know in the village of West Salem, we're doing our part, um, but looking at, at the state level, like shoring up and helping these smaller operations who don't have the resources of the larger, uh, larger endeavors, helping them to meet the same, the same standards as far as phosphorus and other chemical runoffs and making sure that they're able to um, do business and, um, you know, benefit from the, the scale that that can be brought to bear on those issues. Um, I feel that 
you know, it's it, this. We don't need to be an environment where only the the big the big dogs survive in agriculture. Um, you know, there 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 has to be room for uh, for smaller fish in that pond so that they can grow and and you know serve their customers, serve their communities as best as they can. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Well, as you all know, agriculture is near and dear to me. Um, even the water from my well um, is clean enough for me to drink. Um, one of the biggest issues facing uh, farmers, just like any other business, is just the evolution of, of how the industry is moving, making sure our markets are open and fair. Um, the recent passage of USMCA by our president did an awesome job of opening that up. Um, other regulations that come down on us need to be sustainable. We need to look at this to make sure that farmers are the best stewards of their environment. Clean drinking water is important. Clean air is important. Conservation practices to achieve that is important. Farmers are the front line to environmental um, issues. And they need to be embraced and helped and nurtured along to make sure that consumers also realize this. And it's bigger than agriculture in the world that we live in. Thank you, Representative Doyle. I think that we need to encourage and promote more local producers to more Westby creameries, more Craig's Meats, those types of, of entities. I think that we can also help far individual farmers with uh, grants for farmer planning and for cash flow and, and so forth. But, you know, in this last session, um, I really devoted a lot of time to uh, an issue that I think is very important also for farmers and, and, and groups beyond farmers. And that it was, uh, I was the vice chair of the suicide prevention task force appointed by uh, speaker Robin Voss uh, to look at issues that can help people as humans. Uh, and I, I think that that is something that we can't overlook when we're talking about the, the farm crisis going on right now. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Next, we have a question for Mr. Hoyer from Bob Heiss of the La Crosse Tribune. Bob, over to you. Yes, given that the legislature hasn't met in quite a while, what would be the one or two issues that you would like, as soon as you meet, that you'd like to make, see of our priorities or you, you would debate and really do something about? Or what are, maybe there are things you're hearing from uh, voters, but what, what would you want to get, hit the ground running with? Mr. Hoyer, if you caught that, <laughs> go ahead. I'm, I'm not sure if I heard all of that, but um, you know, some of the issues I think we really need to move forward on is, is groundwater safety. Um, I've been an advocate for groundwater and, and environmental safety for, for years with my work um, on the American Soybean Association, also sitting on a sustainability board called Field Rise, which was based in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it has... Um, has been right key with everything I'm looking for. As a certified crop advisor, um, I have to sign a, uh, an affidavit saying that I uphold the, the highest environmental standards possible to hold those credentials. So one of the first things that I really would like to see the, uh, the legislature to come forward on is to make sure that our environment is, is safely cared for and sustainably cared for. Secondly, would be just to make sure that our, as we come out of this COVID crisis, our small businesses are looked, looked out for to make sure that they have the resources, the tools, the support that they can move forward to keep their employees um, uh, employed and that our economy can get rebooted and started again and we don't go through a, a deep recession. And, and lastly, just offering all the support that we can to our law enforcement to make sure that they can keep us safe in our homes. It's very important that we have that, that safety we all can fall back on. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle. Right today, we should be in session dealing with the issues that relate to the pandemic. So we need to get people back to work. We need to help our small businesses. And by the way, um, I introduced a small business reopening plan even before the governor did. I think I was the first elected official in the state to put forward a, a plan in, in that regard. Uh, but after we get a handle on the economy and, uh, and the health crisis, then I think when we're in session uh, starting in January, we need to focus on what I would consider the top three priorities, healthcare, education, or healthcare, education, and transportation. We need to look at those as investments, not simply as expenditures, and we need to work on all three of those topics. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, and definitely the immediate the immediate topic to be addressed is the uh, the COVID outbreak and how best to respond to that and to help uh, families and businesses um, 
make ends meet in the meantime. Um, following that, once we've once we're on to regular business, definitely looking at places to make investments, to make people's lives easier, to to take um, advantage of the fact that we are, you know, the United States of America. We are, you know, Wisconsin, part of that club, fortunate enough to have access to all of the benefits and, and resources that we do, trying to invest uh, education, health care, um, uh, multiple different areas, just to try and, and boost us up and make make a better world for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next, we have a question for Representative Doyle from Ezra Wall of Wisconsin Public Radio. Ezra? Thanks. According to 2019 census.gov estimates, La Crosse County is about 91% white, a disparity that area minorities are keenly aware of. If reelected, what will you do to amplify and center the voices of black, indigenous, and people of color in our district? You know, I think that's an area that has gotten less attention than it really than it really needs. And so I would look at a couple different things. First of all, I, w I, I commend what's going on in the city of La Crosse with regard to our local police department saying that, you know, here's what we're trying to do to be more culturally sensitive and in, in creating a community dialogue. I think that's really important to make sure that people understand that we look at everyone the same and, and people aren't being singled out for uh, better or worse treatment. Uh, but beyond that, we also have to have greater sensitivity, uh, really just in opportunities, whether it's for jobs or for promotions or for education. Um, and I think the state can play a role in that. Uh, I would encourage, and I know people don't like to always talk about create a committee for this or a task force for that, but I've had great success being a member of speakers task forces with our bipartisan approach to dealing with really tricky and knotty issues. And I think that getting together the right group of people, some from each party, to talk about the legislative approach to a dealing with cultural sensitivity would be a step in the right direction at the state level. Thank you. Mr. Brown. All right, and yes, and for my part, I would I would be working to engage with members of our of our minority communities to uh, to make sure their voices are heard. Um, I, when I was at Western Technical College, I was in the uh, Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, and our project for that year was uh, focusing on like racial issues and racial communication, working to um, to create a dialogue so people can speak freely with one another and not feel like they're going to get shot down or that they've said the wrong thing. Um, we definitely, you know, we can't we can't be in an environment of of others constantly. You know, it's got to be us. It's it's all of us. We need to work together to um, to make sure that we appreciate different cultures and different perspectives on things. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. I think Mr. Brown said it pretty good there. It's about us. It's not about me or you, but about us. We live in a very diverse uh, area, um, not only environmentally, but, but culturally too. And it's important that everyone is included and everyone's voice is heard. Um, we, we hear about systemic racism or systemic this, systemic that. And to me, systemic starts from the root. And we have to take measures to go back to the root of what's happening. None of us are born with the uh, preconceived notions that we have, but we're taught that. So we need to go back, look at our family units, look at our educational units, and make sure that the proper um, respect and the proper responsibility is being, uh, being encouraged so we can move forward and we all can get along together and all live in harmony and, and treat each other as, as if we wanted to be treated. And that's, that's very important, not only here in the 94th, but around the country. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer, and thank you to the members of our media panel for their questions today. We will now transition to closing statements by the candidates. Each candidate will have one minute for their closing statement. Mr. Brown, you can go first. You have one minute. All righty. Well, thank you uh, first to the hosts and panelists of today's debate and to all of you at home working to stay informed. Uh, to my fellow candidates, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to the third. Uh, I'm running for assembly because I enjoy problem solving, and Wisconsin, like the rest of the country and the rest of the world, faces its fair share of problems to solve. Thankfully, I believe we here in the Cooley region are well equipped to take on the challenges we face. I'm running as an independent because I have lost faith that the two parties can say the same. Too much of our discourse is locked into the languages of us versus them, um, people chained to their teams, red and blue. We are free to be so much more than this. We are so much more than this. 
if you feel this way, I would encourage you to step outside of your comfort zone and give independents a chance by voting for me this November. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hoyer, you have one minute for your closing statement. Thank you. And thank you to the panelists for the awesome questions. It was, it was uh, a great opportunity to be able to, uh, to answer those and listen to the other questions. Um, in closing, we need to have, uh, have a representative that represents us to Madison, grassroots nonpartisan. The best way of doing that is picking a person who has that experience, that experience that dates back to the early 2000s, where grassroots and nonpartisan is anything and everything that I have known. Party politics needs to get out of the way. We also have to ensure that party money is not in play here. It's hard to be bipartisan or be a leader when your party drops in over $350,000 into your campaign fund and then expects you to be nonpartisan or to represent the people. Why is money from California, New York, and even our, the governor from Illinois, who's, who kicked in $2.5 million to the Wisconsin Democrat Party coming into the 94th district. We don't need Bears fans to help pick the next leader, the next representative for the 94th district. Thank you, Mr. Hoyer. Representative Doyle, you have one minute for your closing statement. Thank you. You know, I'm really proud to be what uh, I think Republicans consider to be the go-to man. Um, when uh, my colleagues in the Republican Party are looking for a Democrat to co-sponsor bills, uh, it seems like I'm almost always the first one that they come to. Uh, when Speaker Republican Speaker Robin Voss is looking for people to help lead the Speaker's task forces on, on difficult issues, whether it is uh, kids in foster care and the child welfare system or suicide prevention or uh, adoption, uh, he comes to me. Uh, that tells me that the Republicans respect my position as somebody who uh, listens to both sides and doesn't uh, follow a particular party line. Uh, when, when issues come up, I don't look at them as a Democrat or Republican. I look at those issues uh, as what's best for my particular district and what's best for the state of Wisconsin in terms of moving us forward. And, and I think that's why you see that I've been endorsed by liberals, conservatives, business groups, labor groups, and so forth, because they know where I come from and they know where I'm going. Thank you, Representative Doyle. This concludes our debate for the 94th District in the Wisconsin State Assembly. Thank you to the members of our media panel from Wisconsin Public Radio, the La Crosse Tribune, WKBT News 8 Now, and WXOW.